Hi, this is Gary Mitchell. I'm Editor-in-Chief and Co-Founder of Automation World Magazine, and I'd like to welcome you to this webcast, A Better Way with Wireless I.O. As an introduction, I have followed something called the Internet of Things for a long time. Originally, it was called something like M2M, and then Pervasive Internet, and Internet of Things. And I notice several companies are jumping on this bandwagon, especially Advantech, whose CEO has talked a lot about um, making the Internet of Things a focus for the company. And as I look at this whole topic of Internet of Things and the way th the idea is things just talking to each other all the time without human intervention and the, th the technology that is going to really play heavily in this really coming about is wireless, all kinds of wireless communications and the technologies are really starting to gel. Uh, 14 years ago they were talking about cellular communication and it was 2G and now 2G has kind of gone away and and so on but there are a raft of technologies and you see some on the slide there 802.11, 802.14.5 um, cellular, there's other things and a lot of wireless technology is coming along it's really solid now, really seems to be moving along and that's what I've been seeing and with me today is Mark Locus who's product sales manager for the Atom Remote I.O. modules business. And he's going to take us into a deeper dive in this whole idea of wireless and connected things and, uh, and, and that whole sort of thing and some new products that they have at Advantech. So welcome to this webcast, Mark. Thanks, Gary. It's good to talk to you again. Good, good to hear from you. Now let's, let's just jump in. How important do you think wireless communication is becoming in, in automation? Uh, what have you been seeing? Well, obviously wireless is, is um, becoming important to the whole world, to consumers a great deal. But since I.O. or wireless I.O. was first started, uh, especially with automation and the industrial automation, in about uh, 2002, 2003, you really started to see it, uh, especially with Advantech. The acceptance rate is, is really grown in orders of magnitude. I mean, it, it's consistent with Moore's Law and its growth, you know, with the price and the size getting much smaller and the functionality and flexibility rapidly increasing. Um, it's, it, it's being accepted to a high degree. It, a long time ago, well, not a long time ago, but many years ago, um, engineers were using uh, radio modems to interconnect serial devices and uh, serial I.O. So you could put uh, serial I.O. out on a tank farm or something like that and connect it through these radio modems. But the idea of wireless I.O. in the I.O. or in the specific uh, transducer module didn't really catch on with engineers and was not a trusted commodity with industrial automation until Wi-Fi or IEEE 802.11. That it proved itself with consumers of all things. Today we have um, many wireless technologies, each satisfying a niche that best fits the application. In some cases, I guess like you mentioned, cellular, where you've got 4G today and everybody wants high speed and high data rates, they also want it plugged into their ear. So the 4G phone may also have Bluetooth capability so that you can have an earpiece. Advantech uh, chose IEEE 802.15.4, um, which is often popularly called Zigbee, as a wireless communication standard because it was best suited to the wireless sensor networks, or what is commonly called WSNs. Um, it is uh, very robust, it is low power, and um, it, it has sufficient data uh, communication rate to fit the needs of uh, wireless I.O. Now the wireless trends, um, well, uh, they caught on fairly quickly with some vertical markets, some industries, such as building automation. Uh, building automation, um, many people see that in their security, in their homes, things like that, and uh, often in businesses where uh, energy management is important. Um, the building automation industry specifically is projected to grow pretty quickly yet for many years with uh, wireless I.O. So I think that's become a trusted commodity in that technology and um, in 
industrial automation as we see it coming about. But um, industrial automation may be actually growing faster, as our chart indicates. Um, and uh, you see uh, that the industrial automation people are early adopters. That isn't to say wireless will ever totally replace wired or be trusted for everything in every application, which we might uh, classify as something like mission critical. For instance, nuclear power plants will uh, be slow to adopt something like that. And certainly in the consumer realm, certain things like vehicular I.O. in your car and that type of thing, and any related mobile applications like in uh, aircraft is not going to be as quickly adopted. But um, I think that you're going to see that um, uh, uh, change quite a bit. I, I, I think so. I think we're just on the cusp of uh, seeing a lot of things uh, happening with wireless. And I thought maybe you could discuss from your vantage point uh, why you're seeing companies uh, moving toward wireless. You know, what kind of benefits are they seeing? Or, you know, the infamous return on investment, all the, all the bean counters need to know what their return is. And what are you seeing about all that? Well, um, we just discussed the trust factor, obviously, and this is um, really a matter of confidence for the engineers to a high degree, for the specifying engineers, uh, the uh, design engineers, and it's both pragmatic and emotional for them. What I mean by that is, does it work on paper? Can they design it in and it really works and they trust it from an engineering standpoint? And do they believe in their heart that it's going to work? That's, that's important, too. Actually, this is happening in the industrial environment. They believe in it. But in, in a way, you have to say, uh, what did you expect? And even management can, can catch the uh, vision now, I think. Um, for instance, many people um, have installed their own uh, remote entry keypad for their garage door openers. Or at least they know that such a thing exists and that it's a fairly simple thing um, uh, screwed to some part of their house. Um, if I asked, was it easy to install to somebody that installed it, they might answer, yeah, sure, it was easy. A couple of screws, add a battery, a couple button presses, and, and you're done. Um, how, did you, uh, how did you connect it, I might ask? How did you get it connected to the opener? And they would just say, well, it's wireless. It's just a battery-powered wireless device. And then we might ask, but it allows entry into your home, someplace that you need to have established trust. Are you sure it's secure? Most people would say they believe it's secure enough for what they need. And practically speaking, that's the way it is. How many people would uh, really be without their car key fob to open their car door wirelessly now? Or their GPS, or certainly their cell phone fits into that uh, category. How hard would it be to do all these things if all these functions had to be tethered by a copper wire or fiber optic cable? Well, cell phones have often been referred to as um, you know, the first IoT device or, or the Internet of Things device. They certainly are everywhere, and it seems like everyone has at least one of them. They're becoming, you know, much more powerful. Uh, they're, they're consumer devices, um, but they can do everything. They, can, they have built-in mapping, built-in GPS functions, all kinds of wireless functions. They have full web access. They can access um, the cell towers. They can access um, the web and Wi-Fi. Um, and they, uh, you know, they might even allow a young child to believe that he can start a car with a wave of his hands <laughs> and the power of the force. Um, all of these things are being accomplished uh, through cell phone technology and wireless technology. Um, but that's also happening with industrial automation and, and building management as well. You know, an, an operations manager wants to turn off all of the lights in, in uh, the plant uh, with just his cell phone. Today, that, that really can be easily done, but it's a matter of trust. Is it reliable enough? You know, is it secure enough? Is it deterministic enough? And is it cost-effective enough to persuade management that, yeah, I trust it, but is this the thing we should use? Advantech and other early adopters are carefully crafting the IoT architecture to offer strong alternative uh, or affirmative replies to this, strong ways of saying, yes, that it is secure, 
it is deterministic enough and it really is cost effective and you'll get your return on investment. That all sounds really good, but uh, talking to end users over the years, there seems to be a, a little bit of fear, especially when you mentioned the cellular part of it, uh, you know, which would be what happens if wireless communication fails? We've had dropped calls, but in automation, there could be consequences more than just having to call back your friend. Uh, so, you know, could cause damage or that sort of thing. What do, what's the answer to that? Well, um, you have to ask a question in, in every design and in, in, in every design engineer's mind. You've, you've hit what they're, they're wondering about. Um, you know, in the old days, in the mainframe computer days, there was a saying, no one was ever fired for buying IBM. In other words, um, you, you can't be blamed if you are using the best technology and the top provider. And so the tendency is going to be to use wired I.O. The tendency is going to be to select what you feel secure with. Um, uh, but you have to ask yourself today, what is the best technology? For instance, if you're launching a network, wired or wireless, how many switches do you need? Do you need the redundancy? Do you need a ring bus so that you have that uh, redundant capability? Does your system support fully connected reliability where every single device and node talks to every other uh, node? How much wire and infrastructure will it take? How, how much does it cost to make sure that it's 100% reliable and never fails? Is that really necessary? Um, Advantech chose the IEEE 802.15.4 standard because it lends itself well to mesh networking. Um, there are many reasons why wireless can be uh, shown to be rely a reliable solution. But, you know, mesh networking is one that I've observed, and, and it's really a good example. With a wired or a uh, wireless uh, networking solution, uh, one significant concern is um, with the hardware and, and, and infrastructure failure, mainly something like a wire break or a switch fails, uh, the fiber optic opens up. Um, with mesh networking, the answer is simple. The individual endpoints um, and nodes or the I.O. modules are communicating with more than one point of connectivity. So with mesh, they always have a way back to the, um, uh, to the, to the main connection. If any aspect of the connection is lost, all communication switches to the second uh, best layer, to the second best uh, available path. Typically, uh, with a single failure, no uh, slowdown in communication is experienced at all. Mesh networking um, brings several advantages, I think, um, to your automation paradigm. It offers this self-healing characteristic, this uh, ability to fix itself, and it's just inherent, that keeps the data flowing and significantly incre increases your uh, reliability. But, you know, mesh can also contribute significantly to the efficiency of the operation with respect to periodic maintenance, because individual modules are easily removed from, from that communication loop without any disruption of service at all. You can just pull it out and, and Mesh knows about that disconnection. Sounds good. But you, you've mentioned reliability, but people often confuse reliability with another word, determinism. Does Mesh networking make a wireless network deterministic? Well, no, not at all. And, and you got me there. The Mesh networking is, does not make things deterministic. Mesh networking does make the network more reliable, that's for sure. But for a network to be deterministic, it must have highly predictable performance. Advantex Atom 2000 series um, has a built-in feature that allows the performance of the wireless network to be highly predictable. The Atom 2520Z, which is a uh, Modbus RTU gateway module, um, converts the secure and proprietary IEEE 802.15.4 protocol that Advantech uses to standard Modbus RTU over serial. 
It supports both RS-485 connection uh, to allow the wireless network to be added to um, any existing Modbus RTU network, or it also supports USB connection to hook the gateway uh, directly to your um, PC control device. When, the, when a sensor, um, transducer in our case, but somewhat built-in um, temperature humidity sensing, um, uh, such as the 2131Z, senses some change of state or some change in the uh, the actual uh, temperature or humidity so that, that that input state is changed, it automatically wakes up its transmitter and sends this new data to the gateway. In many applications um, in, in our Advantech 2000 series, we also apply routers which is a sort of repeater for the uh, I.O. modules to extend its range and allow it to continue to jump in a repeated fashion. So uh, from one repeater to the next, we can go up to 1,000 meters or one kilometer, and, uh, and that then can be extended another 1,000 meters to the gateway module itself. Uh, when the gateway receives the data, it actually sends an acknowledgment back to the I.O. module through the routers, through the repeaters, um, to verify that it received the correct data. You know, if the I.O. module, like the 2031Z humidity and temperature module, does not receive that ACK or an acknowledgement, it will continue to send the data um, for an additional uh, five repetitions, and it'll wait for an ACK. So that takes a finite period of time to accomplish, and that makes it very de de deterministic. Although, you know, this is not as fast as uh, determinism of and the predictability of something like PLC scan. It is deterministic and will complete its acknowledgement process in those five tries. And so it's very usable in the right applications. Um, well, that sounds really good, Mark, and uh, it's a, it's a good answer to, to to compare the two things because people do confuse terms a lot. Trust me. So, you talked about putting this in as part of a system, but most controls or controllers like PLCs are not equipped with wireless communication. So we need to make it go from wireless to them. How do you connect that together? Yeah, that's true. That's that's really a good point. Um, this is a function of that Modbus RTU gateway, the uh, Atom 2520Z. It's uh, a major feature of our Atom 2000 family, um, and it allows the wireless network to be connected really quite quickly and easily um, to an existing wired network using the serial Modbus RTU protocol, typically on RS-385. Um, or the wireless network can also be connected directly to a uh, control device like a PC or a PLC uh, via RS-485 or USB and always communicating over Modbus RTU. Now we uh, actually provide, for instance, .NET drivers. So for you know the adventuresome soul, that engineer that wants to establish control with his PC e easily and wirelessly, Advantech even provides free Modbus RTU .NET drivers. So the application can be, be built from scratch, or the drivers added to an existing .NET application. So you you simply add a, a, the gateway to the uh, I/O modules as you desire, and um, it, it, you know it, it it adds it to the Modbus RQ um, uh, network. And you might say, you know. It just can't be that easy, right? It's just not that easy, but it is. And the free configuration utility that Advantech also includes with the Atom, every Atom 2000 module makes it all the easier. If an Ethernet network, for instance, is in place, but not a serial RS-485 network, or they're not using Modbus RTU, to continue to um, add the serial gateway and the, and the uh, wireless modules to that, it's a simple addition of a uh, gateway Modbus TCP to Modbus RTU uh, module like Advantex Eki Gateway products. It makes this solution so easy and quick to install, and it really is a, a cost-effective way to add wireless to your uh, I.O. system. Let's go back and talk technology a little bit more. 
Uh, why did Advantech choose uh, the networking scheme IEEE 802.15.4 WPAN? Well, that's uh, a pretty uh, uh, pretty easy one to answer from Advantech's perspective, uh, because to a high degree, the selection of 802.15.4 was driven by um, the ability of that standard to be power efficient whenever necessary. When using the battery powered modules, this would allow um, extended periods of remote operation without any human intervention at all. But the major advantage of the battery powered module is um, that it's so easy to install. There are no wires to connect, no power wires, no communication wires. You know, most users actually install the batteries, even in powered modules, because they want to uh, uh, a battery backup in case there is a loss of power. But if you're not wiring power to the terminal block, it makes the module very easy to install. For one thing, the module comes um, with brackets. Every Atom 2000 series module comes with a DIN rail bracket and a panel mounting bracket. Using um, the two sides, uh, the two side screws on the module, you can actually stack two or three modules as well. So you can stack these modules, and mount them on a DIN rail, mount them on the panel bracket, very dense I.O. capability if you need it. So in, in places where um, the panel space is really limited and it's a premium value, you've got the room to put uh, Advantech Atom 2000 wireless modules. You know, being a self-contained, battery-powered, wireless I.O. transducer like the Atom 2000 with optionally built-in sensors like humidity, temperature, we're adding CO2 or CO sensors, I'm sorry, and um, uh, light sensors and uh, other capabilities like the easy mounting hardware that's included free and a push button on the side of the module that allows basic local configuration of the module. And it automatically integrates itself into the mesh network actually pretty easily. That makes the Atom 2000 solution, you know, one of the most cost-effective I.O. installations you can ever possibly do. Let's, uh, let's go back and visit this battery power a little bit you've been talking about. Doesn't that mean a transmission distance would be limited? Yeah, good point. Actually, it's kind of funny. 802.15.4 has the same uh, transmission when using full power as Wi-Fi or 802.11. Both are rated to go one kilometer. Of course, it's limited by you know any obstruction and things like that. So it can go that distance, but when it does go that distance, it's using uh, more power. But the other advantages of the um, 802.15.4 is that its packets are much smaller, the amount of system resource or the cost for us to build the mod modules is much lower because the whole thing, the whole stack runs in 32K of memory versus one megabyte for um, Wi-Fi. Uh, the data rate is much lower. It's not uncommon to hit 10 megabits uh, in Wi-Fi, but we only hit uh, 250 kilobits in, um, in uh, 802.15.4. But the number of nodes that we can do, the flexibility that we have, the small packet size that, that, that lets it um, get its data across more quickly, and the fact um, that it has a low duty cycle, that means that it, it can transmit whenever it needs to, uh, makes it a really flexible module. Um, so I think that you can see um, that, you know, Advantech, really chose the uh, the best solution for this type of sensor module. 802.15.4 is most famous for mesh, and you've been talking a lot about mesh, and it has a lot of advantages, but maybe people would want some other sort of topology. Is it configurable, or do you have to use only the mesh topology? Um, no, you don't, you don't only have to use the mesh topology. It's absolutely configurable, and it's configured with the free Atom configuration software. So, you know, certainly there are um, you know, tremendous advantages to using mesh net networking. 
but it's not the most power efficient method of networking because of the persistent transmission and acknowledgement that has to be used to ensure uh, connectivity uh, through the best path or to be established on a secondary path if necessary. But simpler configurations are often used to accomplish the highest degree of power efficiency and battery life. Every application is different, and the Atom 2000 series is designed, designed um, to fit a great variety of applications, from a power miser type of application like a monitoring system to a very reliable large area uh, array where you might actually use mesh networking. Besides the battery power and, and Modbus RTU gateway connectivity, uh, you have any other unique features with this product? Now, I tell you, Gary, there's almost too many to mention because it's really a, a neat, high-technology product. But one of my favorites is the OTA firmware update. OTA is over the air. And uh, this is really a, a neat feature because um, it allows the user, using that free Advantec configuration utility, to send a copy of new firmware to the module. Now the module will receive that firmware um, update and store it in a, uh, a memory uh, buffer as a backup of that firmware and hold it there until it's able to um, update the uh, firmware. Um, the user simply you know, sends the update um, and it arrives and the Atom 2000 target module acknowledges that the firmware has been fully received and successfully stored in that buffer and the module uh, it, it holds it in that offline um, uh, buffer ready to update its, its firmware. Then that copy of the firmware is moved into the runtime area for the firmware when the module is in a quiescent state and is able to um, uh, accomplish that without uh, influencing the activity of the I.O. The module then reboots itself and with seconds is back in operation. That sounds, uh, sounds like a good feature. Let me take you back to something you mentioned earlier called uh, reduced periodic maintenance. Uh, sounds like a uh, interesting return on investment opportunity. So how can this wireless I.O. system deliver this ROI? Well, you know, um, the user application can actually perform this task just using Modbus RTU and look at the modules and um, uh, make sure that they're operating correctly, efficiently, everything's working right. And so that's great for maintenance. But we actually provide in that free Atom utility something that we call the Site Survey Utility. This is a great tool because you, it will automatically sense all of the I.O. modules connected to that uh, WPAN network. It will um, allow you to place them on the screen. And then on the graphic screen, you can overlay a graphic of your site and place the uh, references for each of the modules in the physical place where they exist on the site so that you can look at uh, the status of all of uh, your modules and each module specifically for, say, battery status, reception uh, status, how many bars is it getting, and the I.O. Uh, state, for instance, is an I.O. point on or off, or what's the temperature or humidity. This status can be um, uh, seen on something like a street map or a building map, and it gives you the physical location of the modules so that the actual location of each sensor can easily be identified by the operator. Well, all this technology and feature talk is interesting, but engineers, being engineers, love to have examples of how these products are being used uh, and especially successfully. Do you have any examples yet of where this wireless I.O. is being used successfully? Yeah, I, Gary, I'd like to tell you real quickly about three of them. Um, one of them is a greenhouse application. It's actually for a fairly large greenhouse farm. And the atom modules have really contributed um, to the environmental uh, monitoring and control in that um, uh, greenhouse setting. Uh, we used uh, a series of um, uh, humidity and temperature monitoring modules, the 802-15, uh, 
uh, or I'm sorry, the uh, 2031Z module, and we also used our analog input module and digital input module to monitor various analog readings like uh, water, uh, salinity, that type of thing, and the digital input modules sensed uh, positions for light curtains and a variety of other uh, tools in the greenhouse. So it was easy for them to add this wireless I.O. to their uh, greenhouse application with the Modbus RTU gateway, the 2520Z. And because it's battery powered, they could add those I.O. modules anywhere they uh, uh, wanted to. Another um, uh, application that I kind of like is, the, is a printed circuit board um, machine monitoring system. We had a situation where a customer had a variety of printed circuit board uh, machines, each using different controls and different uh, types of buses for communication. Um, the team that was doing SQC decided that the easiest thing to do was to take the Atom 2051Z digital input module, hook photo eyes to it, watch the uh, stack light on the machine with the photo eye, and transmit the uptime um, using that information from the stack light from the from the green light and how long it was lit. So monitoring stack lights where differing communication protocols was one great uh, success um, with these modules, and it gives them really accurate information on how long those machines are down and not running. A third one I want to tell you about is the uh, cold chain logistics monitoring. You know. Um, in this uh, particular situation, when um, you know a, a trucking firm has many different vehicles that are uh, moving products that are uh, sensitive to the tem uh, temperatures inside of the vehicle, um, it's necessary for not only the driver to monitor that at, that at all times, but also the trucking firm's uh, central control station to monitor. So by giving the driver a mobile data terminal that uplinks to uh, Ethernet, we gave him the link uh, to his um, uh, terminal, and then we used the Atom 2520Z, again, that Modbus RTU gateway, to tie into that uh, data terminal and talk to a battery-powered temperature and humidity sensor, the 2031Z, back in the trailer. And this allowed for the central control to actually watch and and uh, record and data log all of that data uh, for the temperature of these temperature sensitive products that are being transmitted. So those are three good examples of of how the uh, Atom 2000 wireless is being used. It's always good to know that uh, that they work. Uh, speaking yeah. as somebody who used to work in engineering, uh, that was always my first question. Oh, you mean it really works? So it's always good yeah. to know. <laughs> so on top of all this, I was just curious what the future looks like for Advantech and their wireless I.O. line. Well, um, although Advantech believes that the 802.15.4 uh, standard is the most important network technology for our IoT type uh, wireless remote I.O., um, we're also developing similar technology um, for other solutions like uh, 802.11 Wi-Fi type solutions and cellular, uh, such as GPRS. So our objective is a well-rounded series of products that, uh, that address the needs of all of IoT, both from the needs of specific vertical markets, um, such as power and energy, for instance, and also to address the needs of device level things like in power and energy, what types of IO uh, sensors are being used and what's being sensed and developing IoT products uh, specific to that. So Advantech's goal is to enable an intelligent planet by empowering individuals and corporations to be connected to the real world around them. Well, that's certainly an ambitious goal and I, I wish you well as uh, it would really help all of our manufacturers out there improve manufacturing processes and hopefully efficiency and profitability. So thank you very much, Mark, for uh, talking with us about this, this important technology. My name is Gary Minchel, 
Editor-in-Chief of Automation World Magazine. I've been talking to Mark Lacus, who's Product Sales Manager of Advantech for their Atom Remote I.O. modules, and we've been talking about a better way with wireless I.O. and some new product lines coming out from Advantech. Thank you for listening. Signing out. Goodbye.